Welcome to the Just Ingredients Podcast. I'm Cara Lynn, and here we talk all things nourishing to the mind, body, and soul. This is a place where you can find just good ingredients to life. This podcast is sponsored by Llama Naturals. I learned about Llama Naturals a few months ago, and I honestly wish someone had told me about them sooner. I always recommend that people get their vitamins from whole food sources, not synthetics. But I could never find a good option for my kids until I found Llama Naturals. They have a full line of delicious gummies that are made with real fruit, no added sugar or sweeteners, plus vitamins from whole foods. They are USDA organic, vegan, gluten-free, and allergen-free. Plus, they are seriously delicious. You can save 20% off your first order by going to llamanaturals.com and using the coupon code JUST, J-U-S-T. My whole family loves them, but if you have a picky eater, they offer a money-back guarantee. Seriously, you should at least go to their site and compare their label against any other gummy brand out there. They are the best I've found. Again, it's llamanaturals.com. Sarah Hanna Silverstein is the author of the book Moodtopia, Tame Your Moods, De-Stress, and Find Balance Using Herbal Remedies. She is a master herbalist, classical homeopath, board-certified lactation consultant, businesswoman, wife, keynote speaker, and mother of seven children. She is regularly featured on TV news shows across the U.S. discussing how people can integrate alternative medicine with conventional medicine. She is a consultant to many pediatricians, obstetricians, midwives, general doctors, and guest lectures to residents at medical schools. After working with over 235,000 clients for the past 20 years, she saw that most people needed help with their moodiness and created a program that teaches people how to be in control of your moods so they don't control you. Thank you, Sarah Hanna, so much for being on my show today. I'm really excited to talk to you because my forte is definitely not in herbs. So I'm really excited to ask you all the things that I've been wanting to know about herbs. And so first, tell my listeners a little bit about yourself your background, and how you became interested in studying about herbs. Caroline, it's so great to be on this show with you. I really respect and honor all the work that you're doing, and I'm thrilled to be sharing with you about the herbs and uh, my story of how I got there. So um, when I was in university, I was invited through Yale University to spend a summer at Oxford in England. And although I was studying the great literature, the great authors of the time, when I was in the library, I really gravitated towards botanical medicine, plant medicine. And I started reading books and researching how plants work, the difference between the roots, the difference between the roots and the leaves, the difference between the leaves and the stems, the stems and the flowers. And it was fascinating to me. So then I got married and I had a child and my child had chronic strep throat. And it was very bizarre because I was healthy. I was breastfeeding. I thought it was the most bizarre thing. And it turned out that I went to a Chinese acupuncturist who gave my daughter some Chinese herbs and she never got strep again. Huh. That was it. I mean, I, I jumped in the river immediately into really studying before my daughter, the botanical medicine was in theory. And once I saw its actions in the human body, I said, this is what I needed to study. So I went on and I did a three-year herbal program and I did hundreds of hours in apprentice work. And then I did a five-year classical homeopathic program. And then I went back to school and I studied breastfeeding. So I'm an international board certified lactation consultant. And the reason I'm bringing that up just very quickly was I saw that when women had breast infections, although the typical protocol is to use an antibiotic, which I always tell my clients, of course they can use. But I said, if you'd like to use some botanical medicine or some poultices, and what I found was we could clear all breast infections naturally. Huh. And so I really was excited. And then my clients, when they had babies, I said, look, you know, if your child gets an ear infection, we can always treat it with antibiotics. We know they're there. But if you'd like to go to the doctor, get a diagnosis and then try to treat it naturally, I'm here to help you. And what was amazing was even my pediatrician in my neighborhood 
started calling me saying, wait a minute, how did you treat that ear infection? So I saw, you know, in my clinical practice that people were really recovering with botanical medicine. And that was my start. Oh, I love that. So interesting. So you're considered an herbalist. So an herbalist, is that just someone that will help people with illnesses using botanical medicine? So I'm a medical herbalist, okay, which means I've done a lot of studying, means we study anatomy and physiology, we study disease process, and we really must be familiar with all of the pharmaceuticals that are out there. So I want to begin by saying that when you work with a proficient herbalist, we're not against conventional medicine. I mean, that would be ridiculous. I mean, if you break your leg, go get an x-ray, get a cast, and then you can come to me and I can suggest some herbs that will help bind the bone in a way that it will be stronger. So, you know, even an MRI or a CAT scan, I mean, herbalists love that because the more we can understand, the more we can see. And sometimes my clients, for instance, will be on Synthroid or thyroid medicine and it will be working, but they'll be having trouble keeping their levels stable and they'll go from a higher dose to a lower dose to a higher dose. And then when I work in collaboration with their doctor, because again, I'm not anti-doctor, I can give them an herb that can also support their thyroid. And the next thing they know, they're still on their conventional medicine, but their numbers are getting more stable. So I think the important message for me is that I like to teach people and support people how to integrate botanical medicine in their lifetime. I love that so much. I can't even tell you how much I love that because I am constantly trying to teach the same thing that I'm not anti doctor or medicine, any of that conventional stuff. I love that stuff and think it's a huge blessing, but I'm always preaching like, but there's other alternative things that we can incorporate that will help the conventional medicine as well. So thank you for sharing that. In your book, Moodtopia, you teach that there are natural remedies to boost immunity and help with cold and flu symptoms. So can I pick your brain about some of these herbs that we hear about today? Of course. I mean, that my whole thing, and, and, and as you'll see as we speak, herbalists want to educate and empower people to know about their plant medicine so they can be a partner in integrating it. So ask all the questions. I'm excited. Okay. So elderberry, that is a really trendy one these days. So right. what are your thoughts on elderberry? And is it as beneficial as everybody is claiming t- it to be? So- Elderberry is a berry and berries are very helpful and healthy for the veins, the structure of the lining, the walls of the veins. They're anti-inflammatory. They've got a lot of potent antioxidants in them. And elderberry is a phenomenal herb, but most herbalists combine it with other herbs. So there was interesting studies that took place in Israel with the avian flu. And they found that elderberry was very helpful with the avian flu and helped stop the colonies from overgrowing in the body. So we know that elderberry has antiviral properties, hence why it's helpful for colds. But for me as an herbalist, I don't use it as a single herb. I use it in combination with other herbs. To me, The role of elderberry is anti-inflammatory. It's got a high count of vitamin C and it can help with viral load. But again, I mix it with other herbs. So if someone's coming down with a cold, do you recommend elderberry right at the start of the cold? Because I've heard that if you take elderberry like three, four days into the cold, it's not going to be as effective. Is that true? Well, I would think of elderberry more as a maintenance herb, an herb you can take every single day during the winter season. And if you felt a cold coming on, I would mix the herb with like an echinacea or an istatus or an andrographis. I know those are herbs you're not familiar with that are going to help boost the immune system. So we don't look at elderberry as an immunomodulator 
or to stimulate the immune system, we would look at it again as an anti-inflammatory vitamin C and help with viruses. So it's not my first herb of choice at the beginning of a cold. Okay, if you want me to be honest. I mean, I love elderberry. I have bottles of it in my office. It's just more of an additional herb in the way I practice herbal medicine. That's good to know. So for instance, if we're going to jump for a moment to medicinal mushrooms, medicinal mushrooms are also becoming the rage. We have mushrooms like reishi, chaga, cordyceps, maitake, and those herbs tend to help modulate the immune system. So I would jump in and add with my elderberry, a medicinal mushroom, which would be a little bit more powerful if you feel a cold or flu is coming on. Oh, that is so good to know. So with mushrooms, can you take those daily? Like you said, you can the elderberry or no? Yes, you can. So we have different classifications of herbs and mushrooms and berries, elderberry, are in the food category. So like parsley would also be in the food category. I'm just giving examples. So those are herbs that you can take on a daily basis. Absolutely. Like if someone's a nurse and is constantly being exposed to everything around them, then a nurse should really be taking things that will stimulate her immune system, modulate that immune system, and naturally have antivirals. Someone that's working one week a night shift, the next week a morning shift, the next week, you know, their schedules are erratic. That's a little challenging, you know, when your sleep is a little disorganized. Then they're also someone that could be taking herbs on a daily basis. So another idea of a daily basis, taking herbs on a daily basis, is a lot of my clients will take a certain herb group during the summer. Then when the weather changes and we go into fall, that's the cold, the flus and the mold allergies, they'll switch their herbs. Then in the middle of winter, if you live in a cold climate, they'll take herbs that will help warm the body from the inside because it's really great to put on a jacket and gloves and a hat, but you can drink some ginger tea or put some cinnamon Um, in tincture form in your tea, and that will warm you from the inside out. And then in the spring, we want to have herbs that are more water soluble because we perspire more, we're running around more, we're getting, you know, more vitamin D. So really, herbalists will talk about taking herbs with the seasons also. Oh, that's so interesting. I didn't realize that. Okay, talking about elderberry, I hear different companies claiming that they've processed their elderberry or use different parts of the elderberry plant. And so theirs is better. When I'm looking for elderberry on the market, am I looking for a certain part of the plant or it doesn't really matter? My favorite part of the elderberry plant is actually the elder flower. So I'm passionate about the elder flower. Elder flower is an herb that's a natural antihistamine and decongestant. It also helps a person to handle fevers better. So with children, there's not a mix that I prepare that doesn't have elder flower in it during cold and flu and especially allergy season. I love elder flower for allergy season. So I in my office have a bottle of elder flower tincture and elderberry tincture. The elderberry is more the vitamin C, the antiviral, but the elder flower is more the decongestant, um, helps with fevers, um, can actually help with the lungs and clear the nasal passages. So that's where I use elder flower. Okay. So when I'm at the store looking, is it going to say elder flower versus elderberry? On the consumer market, 99% of your products are going to be elderberry. When you call specific companies that are really herbalists, they will have elderflower available. I think you'd have to search a little bit more. The elderflowers are these delicate, beautiful, white, humble flowers. Everyone should look up what an elderflower looks like online. It's just a gorgeous flower. It's harder to make that into medicine than elderberry. So I think that's why at this point, it's not as common on the market, but oh my gosh, I buy it by the gallon full in my office. Okay. That's good to know. Okay. One last question about it. So a a lot of people say like 
take elderberry for seven days and then give your body a few days off and then take it again. Is that nonsense? total 100% nonsense. They used to say that with the herb echinacea, and that was totally disproven. So here's the story, especially since you're into putting healthy foods in our body. Would you tell anybody if they were making a smoothie, like, okay, blueberries, take them for six days, <laughs> and you've got to go off of them for six days? No, we like to have a rainbow diet for sure, which I'm sure you speak about. You know, we want strawberries and peaches and blueberries and blackberries in our smoothies. But no, you don't have to ever go off of elderberry. You can make elderberry wine. You can make elderberry as a pancake syrup. How yummy is that? Elderberry, think of it more as a food herb. Don't be intimidated by it. And again, you know, on our podcast, we're not going to diagnose, but you can literally for the average person take a tablespoon of elderberry. You don't have to take drops of elderberry. It's a berry. That is explained so well. Thank you so much. Because people also ask me like, well, can I overdose on the elderberry? But what you're saying, that's like saying, can you overdose on blueberries? I mean, I guess if you only ate blueberries all day long and nothing else. So that's good information. Okay, so talking about the immune system, horseradish, does that help during a cold, flu, things like that? Horseradish. Um, is not going to work on the immune system, but it's a natural decongestant. I remember my teacher was once talking about how they used to have in the health food store horseradish, and they used to grind it up, and the workers would just eat it directly, and their sinuses would open, their nasal passages were open. I'm not saying everybody can, you know, eat horseradish directly, but they do have prepared horseradishes in your grocery section. And if you have a stuffy nose or a sinus infection, you can just put a little bit of the pre-made horseradish right on your sandwich and eat it. And when you bite into it, you will immediately ah, feel decongested. If you have chronic sinus infections, I would put horseradish tincture in a mix so that when they take the herbs two to three times a day, they will right away open the nasal passages. So that's where horseradish shines. Thank you for explaining that. Okay, let's move to echinacea, because that's a trendy one with colds as well. Does that help fight colds? Should it be taken when you feel a cold coming on, or is it one you take every day? So there was a study that was done where they totally debunked echinacea, the news everywhere. It was about 12 years ago. And it was very interesting because they said, studies show that echinacea does not help prevent a cold. It does not lessen the symptoms. And I was so confused because I know that echinacea is something fabulous to take at the beginning of a cold and flu. So I looked up the study and it was conducted at a major university. It was financed by a pharmaceutical company. And what they did with the participants were, they did not tell them the dosage, they also gave echinacea in capsule form, and echinacea does not work so well in capsule form, which we're going to discuss. It works better in tincture form. And they also told the participants that they could take Sudafed, Actifed, Claritin wow. at the same time. So why am I saying this? Because this study was set up to show failure. Correct. So it's very important to know who to listen to on the internet, who to follow, because this study was so big and it was really, really, I'm repeating myself, set up to fail. So echinacea is a fabulous herb. It's been used for generations. It's interesting because the main component of the herb that we use is the root. A lot of plants, we like it when it's young, healthy, first growing. We like the, the leaves and the flowers. For echinacea, the most powerful part is in the root. We actually harvest it in the fall. And it's a phenomenal herb to help ground our health. It's a root plant and it grounds our health because we want to be able to walk into a room where people are coughing and sneezing and we want to inhale it because it just goes right in our nose. And we want our lymphatic system and our body to break it down and not become sick. 
So when we take echinacea, I would say that it allows our immune system to be more resilient because most of us do not want to live in a bubble. We want to be able to hike and go and be out. So I love echinacea. It is an amazing herb. And there are other clinical studies that have been performed in, in a better format. And they do show that it does lessen the cold symptoms. It does reduce the time frame that you're sick. And that is an herb to take. Even if you're feeling well and you know you were exposed to something, that's the time to start taking echinacea. So kids in school, for instance, if you've got a kid in a classroom, there's going to be 30 or 40 different viruses and bacteria in the classroom at all times. So you can give echinacea to children on a daily basis from the beginning of school season well into the winter. Oh, that's so good to know. So I want to know why it's better in tincture form because I take it in capsule form because the tincture I have is so disgusting. So maybe I should mix it with elderberry so it tastes better. Right. So the reason I like most herbs better in tincture form is that when you pull a plant out of the ground, it loses its potency very quickly. Think about parsley. You get parsley in the store, it's beautiful green. The next day it's wilting a little. The day after that, it gets a little white. The next day after that, it starts to get, you know, so limp that you throw it in the garbage. So what herbalists do is they take the plant when it's vibrant and even roots are vibrant when you pull them from the ground and you put them in a glass jar, you pour grain alcohol over it you let it sit for six to eight weeks and then you strain it and you have what is called a tincture or liquid form that actually has a 10 year shelf life. Oh, wow. And what happens with the tincture is, and they do taste quite disgusting, which we're going to talk about, but you have the essential oils, you have the plant components, you can make it either in a vinegar a grain alcohol or a glycerite, it breaks down the components of the plant and that liquid just has all the medicinal properties of the plant. So when you take a tincture, what you're supposed to do is get a shot glass, okay. put in a little bit of grape juice or apple juice or cranberry oh. juice. Orange juice is a little too acidic. Take your tincture, drop in a dropper full in the glass cup that is diluted in a little bit of juice and drink it very quickly. So I want to just jump to the yucky taste for one moment. So she had all these business meetings today and I told her like super dose on her herbs yesterday. And she texted me by the end of the day. She goes, oh my gosh, Sarah Hanna, I feel better. I can go to my meetings tomorrow. So when people use herbs in the proper form, you feel it and you're going to desire it when you need it but not because of the taste. Okay. So with echinacea, that is not a food herb then like elderberry. No, no. So you don't need to go on and off of it, but it's not an herb that a body needs all year long. You don't need it all year long. You need it when you feel like you're coming down with a cold or flu, or if you've been exposed to it, or if you're traveling, a lot of my clients, you know, pre-COVID would, you know, have business meetings all over the world. If you're flying from the States to Australia, your time clock is going to be messed up, you know, and, and you want to get some good night's sleep. So taking some echinacea is very good if you're sleep deprived. Okay. Thank you for explaining all of that about echinacea. I'm going to move on to another one, but I don't know if this is considered an herb, but you talk about it in your book, honey. So honey is a good conduit to taking a lot of other plants. Honey itself has antibacterial properties and studies have shown that if you have a cut on your finger, that if you put some honey directly into the cut and cover it with a bandaid, that it can work as well as a bacterial cream or ointment. So we know that it has antibacterial properties and it's really great to use to hold other herbs. So I have clients that travel a lot or used to travel a lot and they would get to a city and they weren't feeling well and they had no access to herbs and there was another language. They wouldn't even know how to find the herbs. And I would tell them, just get honey, get some onions, get some garlic, cut up those onions and garlic, 
put it in a glass cup or a coffee mug, pour some honey over it, let it sit for 24 hours, although you can start taking it 10 minutes later. And what happens is the onions and garlic will break down in the honey and you have a cough syrup and an antibacterial agent right before your eyes. So honey is a really good way to take herbs and take plants. And especially with children over a year old, you can literally on a pan in a very low flame, heat up a little bit of honey and you can put some tinctures like echinacea, elderberry, elder flower, which is from the elderberry plant, which is an antihistamine. You could put in an herb like yerba santa. I know you're not familiar. I'm just throwing out these words. In the honey, heat it up slightly, let it cool. And you can put that over your kid's cereal. You could put it over their oatmeal. And as an adult, you could put that honey in your coffee, that honey in your tea, and you're getting medicinal herbs in your daily life without having to think twice about it. Oh, that's great advice. Okay, so honey is used a lot of times for natural cough syrups, correct? Yes, absolutely. It soothes the throat, calms down the cough, that correct? Absolutely. So honey in itself is anti-inflammatory, antibacterial. And again, if you wanted a powerful cup of tea, if you weren't feeling well, you could literally just put hot water with some honey. You could squeeze a lemon in there. Even if you don't have fresh ginger in your house, you can put a little splash of ginger spice, a little splash of cinnamon spice, which wouldn't taste good if you didn't have it mixed with the honey. And there you've got a medicinal tea that you can keep on your desk at your home office or at your regular office. And it's soothing for the throat and it can help with the cough. Absolutely. It is my favorite go-to for natural cough syrup. So I do recommend it quite often for that. So I love hearing you talk about that as well. Okay. Another one is lemon balm. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So I like to talk about lemon balm because it's an herb that's very easy to grow. People, if they live in a crowded city, can grow it on their windowsill, their fire escape, Or if you have a big, gorgeous backyard, you can grow it right in your backyard or your porch. Lemon balm is in the mint family. It's a safe herb. It's not contraindicated with most medications on the market. And it's calming and soothing and antiviral. So you can do lemon balm in tea because it's in the mint family. If you want to be quick and fast, you can do it in tincture form. You can make it into ice pops for kids when they have fevers because it helps lower fevers. And you can take it if you're having a restless night and you're having trouble sleeping or if you have trouble going to sleep every night, you can take some lemon balm in tincture or tea form at dinner. And again, before you go to bed, it's calming and soothing. Also, my clients that used to fly a lot, if they're agitated on planes, you can carry a little lemon balm with you and take it right under your tongue when you get on the plane before you take off. Or, you know, holiday season, if you're going for Thanksgiving or Christmas and you're traveling and you're being exposed to a lot of germs, that's where lemon balm also shines. So if someone doesn't want to grow it, Lemon balm is a common enough one that they would just find it as a tincture form at the store. You will find it in tincture form, in tea form, tea bags, loose tea, so you can make it yourself. And they also have it in glycerites, which are very sweet. Yes, you don't have to grow it. The reason I mentioned that you could grow it is because sometimes when people start to grow these plants, they become less intimidating, less, oh my gosh, I don't know much about herbs. And you see a little lemon balm plant growing, which it's really hard to kill lemon balm. It's anybody, even without a green thumb. And you can actually just chew the leaf. So it's just an herb that's so safe, grows so easily. I just like people to know about it if they want to just get their toes wet in the world of herbal medicine. I do know that lemon balm is actually really easy to grow. We've grown it before, and I am not a good plant grower, gardener, any of that, but that one is easy to grow. So, yes. Okay. Another herb that you like 
and you like it for sicknesses, I know, is one I don't really know anything about. So tell me about Skullcap. So Skullcap is probably one of my most favorite herbs, although I love all herbs. And it's a very important herb that I speak about in my book, Moodtopia, because my book, Moodtopia, is all about keeping our emotional health intact. And Skullcap is one of those herbs that really help the mind stay calm soothe an agitated stomach for anxiety. So skullcap is used for nervous tension, agitation, fear, anxiety. It's calming and soothing, not only to the stomach, because it's also in the mint family, but it's really calming to the mind. So if people are going through divorces or struggling with a child or lost a job or looking for a new job, being agitated is normal during transitions in life, but the skull cap will temper it. It'll take the edge off of it. It'll make a person feel calm without feeling exhausted. So skull cap is just an herb. I think like 99% of the world should have a bottle of the tincture in their home. Women, men, elderly, even youth can take Skullcap every single day for the rest of their lives or use it only as needed. So if you know that you're going into a nervous situation, maybe the holiday time is nervous for you. You love your family, but your in-laws make you nervous or your parents make you nervous. Then taking Skullcap the week before the holiday season will lower your cortisol stress hormones. And then you can take it during your holiday and you'll see you'll have less flares of anxiety. So I am passionately in love with Skullcap and I want all your listeners to become passionately in love with Skullcap because it's such an amazing herb for the brain. Dang, I'm thinking, where has Skullcap been my entire life? I have needed it after hearing that. Right. So, you know, I want to say that in my book, Moodtopia, one of the reasons I wrote it was because there's a lot of people on the world that are on psychotropic meds and it helps them and it's working for them. And that's phenomenal. Then we have a small portion of people that are like they have it together all the time. Right. And then there's the rest of us. Most of us live in between almost needing psychotropic drugs <laughs> and kind of faking that we're together all the time. Right. Oh, that's so, perfect. So in Mootopia, I talk about sadness, agitation, anger, frustration, depression, melancholy. And these are emotions that people feel all the time and they go in and out of them. And on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the worst, sometimes we're up at a 10 and sometimes we're down to a two. So in Mootopia, I speak about all the herbs that can really be there for us, holding our hands through happy times, sad times, frustrating times. And unfortunately, our world today is not familiar with the botanical world that's available to us to help us keep it together emotionally. And it's a gift for everybody when they start to learn about it. Right. Our society really does not know much about plant medicine. So I love that you're sharing all of this. Let me just ask you a couple things about Skullcap. So is Skullcap considered an adaptogen then? Because an adaptogen helps with stress. And you're saying that this helps with cortisol and stress. So can you classify it as that or no? It's not considered an adaptogen. Adaptogens are nonspecific herbs that work in the body to help be more resilient to stress. So sometimes when you take an adaptogen, you may take it for a month and you may not necessarily feel its effects, but all of a sudden you realize, oh my gosh, I stopped screaming at my husband or, oh my gosh, you know, my neighbor that's been annoying me, I'm a little calmer around. So an adaptogen helps you adapt, whereas skullcap, you feel in your system within 20 minutes and you feel that calm coming over. 
So some adaptogens work in the body immediately. A lot of them, you need to take them for a, a little bit longer period of time so that it reduces the cortisol levels, but skull cap immediately drops in your body quickly and you feel that calm within 20 minutes. Wow. I need to buy some now. I know. <laughs> every, mom, do. every mom needs it, especially Absolutely. ones with toddlers or teenagers. Uh, yeah. And even ones that get older and get married. Yes. Really. That's why I say it's one of my all time favorite herbs. I really haven't found a client in over 30 years of having a clinic that doesn't feel better taking Skullcap. And again, what I love about it is when my clients take Skullcap and kind of the crisis is over, they naturally stop. And then they'll call me three months later and say, oh, Sarah, honey, you know, like, didn't I love Skullcap? You know, you forget, you know, didn't I love Skullcap when I went through like my last crisis? And I'm like, yes, you did. So Skullcap is something you just have in the house and have it available because we all go through little crises, you know, like, you know, every couple hours. So it's an amazing herb. And I'd be surprised if your listeners weren't very impressed with its action. So let me just ask you one last thing about it. Things like CBD oil are supposed to be to help with anxiety and things. But when I take them, I get drowsy. Will skull cap make me drowsy or no? Nope. That's why I love it. It does not. I mean, you can take it before you go to bed to help you sleep. If you're anxious because it's two in the morning, you have to be up at six. You shouldn't have, you know, watched that last show and you're anxious for sure. But it does not have a side effect of being drowsy. I mean, a lot of my keynote speakers will take it before they speak because it doesn't. It just kind of takes the edge off that nervousness, but it is not sedating. Okay. So good to know. So I actually talk about depression quite a bit on my site, just because that is something that I have dealt with personally. And I try to teach people how to better deal with depression. So in your book, Moodtopia, you talk about sadness, depression, things like that. What is a favorite herb of yours for depression? So again, when we speak about depression, everybody experiences it differently. We have people that get depressed and overeat and are nervous, 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 and and anxious, 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 and depressed and overeat. And we have other people that get depressed and they stop eating. They just cannot eat. We have other people that are depressed and they can't sleep. And we have other people that are depressed that become couch potatoes and they're on the couch and they just can't move. So really when I work with a client and we didn't discuss this in the beginning, but when you work with an herbalist, we spend an hour and a half with our first session, really trying to understand what that person's lifestyle is like, what their choices are, you know, who they are as a person. And so back to your depression. So if I had a client that was exhausted, had lethargia, and they really couldn't get up and do what they need to do, an herb I love for depression is rhodiola. Rhodiola has a bit of a boost. It can give you a little zest. Um, Unlike a cup of coffee with caffeine, it can give you that little energy without, you know, the caffeine feeling. And clinical studies and research find that it really helps people with depression get out of their depression and see what they need to do. If I have a client that is depressed and is gloomy, the world is black. They know they have a family that loves them. They have a good job, but they're just gloomy and grumpy. Then I'll use an herb called motherwort. And motherwort helps kind of dissipate that black cloud. And motherwort is wonderful during hormonal cycles in women. And men also have hormonal cycles. So motherwort can be taken before a woman cycles during her cycle and after, because a lot of women will say, oh my gosh, you know, like I'm a happy person, but boy, I get so gloomy. And it's so funny, I have to tell you, because I had a client when I was in herbal school, basically mother wart was the woman's herb, like give it, you know, before babies, after babies, you know, um, before their cycles, during menopause, after menopause. And I had a man come into my office and he 
was so grumpy and crabby and it looked like he was just about to get his cycle, but I knew he wasn't. And so I called his wife, which he gave me permission, HIPAA. I said, is your husband always like this? She goes, uh, yeah. So I kind of broke the mold and I suggested he took motherwort. And his wife called me back two weeks later and said, I don't know what you gave him, but he has been so much less grumpy. So I really learned that motherwort is an amazing herb for grumpy, blue, gloomy males and females. And I think that's an important thing to know about. And I love motherwort as much as I love skullcap and as much as I love rhodiola. That's really good to know. I'm laughing because there might be a lot of listeners running and buying motherwort. <laughs> right now, right now. Yes. Exactly. Okay, so what about for moodiness, depression, hormonal imbalances, things like that? What about ashwagandha? So ashwagandha is an herb that I like for people that have thyroid issues. Ashwagandha is wonderful for people that are pre-thyroid. Like every time they get the blood test, the doctor's like, oh, it's a little questionable, but you're fine. So ashwagandha to me is like food for the thyroid. It's also a good herb for clients that don't feel they have a voice in their lives because your thyroid is located in your throat. And a lot of alternative practitioners say that people that, you know, maybe feel a little suppressed under their partner or suppressed under their boss or feel like their kids are not listening to them and they get agitated from people, you know, their inside brain is going, listen to me, I'm smart. I know what I'm talking about. But on the exterior, they kind of become passive and like let other people lead. That's when I would use ashwagandha because it strengthens the thyroid. It strengthens the ability to communicate what you're feeling. And that's where I feel ashwagandha shines. Oh, that's interesting because when I was dealing with my depression, that's one of the first herbs they put me on or had me take, I should say. Did you like it? Did you feel it was beneficial? Well, I took it along with rhodiola also. So I don't know which one was doing what, but it helped tremendously. So we really like to match the herb to the personality of the client. We like to match the herb to the challenge of the client because there's so many herbs. And when I work with a client, because we are all so complex, if you didn't notice, you know, we can be sad and anxious. We can be happy and depressed, right? We can be content and not content all in the same moment. So I usually use anywhere from four to eight herbs in combination. So when I make an herb for a client, I will put a bunch of different herbs in the same bottle. So for instance, let's say I have someone that's depressed and they're not eating a lot, then I'm going to stick some echinacea in their combination because they'll be more vulnerable to cold and flus, right? Hmm. And if I have someone that is depressed and overeating, but not overeating fruits and vegetables, then I may add some elderberry in their depression herb mix because I want to sneak in some vitamin C and I want to sneak in some berries, right? So when I'm making an herbal combination, I'm looking at the total person, what their challenges are, and I'll put in a medicinal mushroom with a motherwort. Because if someone's really gloomy and seeing the world dark and black, then their immune system's also going to be taking a bit of a hit. So it's very important to you know, be very self-actualized, have your practitioner be self-actualized. So we really know what we're dealing with, right? Right. So for instance, there's an herb called rose, which is a flower. And rose petals are specifically used for people that have broken hearts. So if we have a person that's depressed, anxious, and has a broken heart, they lost a loved one, a marriage that didn't work, a partnership that didn't work, kids that are not going in the path that they felt was the appropriate path for them, then I'm going to put some rose in the mix because rose medicinally helps with 
broken capillaries. So if women or men have broken capillaries on their skin, they can use a little rose essential oil or if they have vein problems. And rose specifically goes to the heart. So that's another herb that I love for people that are going through depression and feel broken hearted. Oh, that's so interesting. And lavender, which is a very popular essential oil, lavender taken internally is for people that are stuck. Their sadness is stuck. They know where they want to go. They see their future, but they're stuck. They can't take that first step. So then I'll include some lavender tincture in with their mix. So I would do, let's say, lavender and let's say motherwort for gloominess and rose for a broken heart and skullcap for agitation, all in the same combination. So in my book, Moontopia, what I do is I break down all the herbs so people know what the herbs are. But I like people to think of herbs like a jazz band. Like, you know, the saxophone is amazing, but put a little keyboard behind it, it's even more powerful. Put a little drum behind it and the music kind of all works off of each other. So the same thing with herbs, but people can learn about the individual herbs in Mutopia and then they can either decide to mix them themselves or they can work with an herbalist. That's a great analogy with the jazz band. And I'm thinking I need to get my hands on your Moodtopia because I need it for reference because there are hundreds of different combinations you could do, it sounds like. I'm going to grab that because I think I could use it for my kids, myself, everyone in my family. Yes. You talked about essential oils really quickly. So I actually want to ask you about essential oils. Do you recommend those along with herbs? Do you like essential oils? Do you like diffusing them or not necessarily? So my feeling on essential oils are that they can really help shift the energy of the room. I had a family member that was in the hospital and I talk about it in Mootopia that I started spraying essential oils in the room. And what happened was the nurses would come in and say, oh, Sarahana, what does that smell today? And I'd say that was lavender. And the next day they'd come in and I'd say that was Lang Lang. And the next day they'd come in and I'd say, oh, well, that's a grapefruit. And what happened was my relative got better care, in my opinion, because our room was such a pleasant place to come to, because hospitals smell like death and dying. So what I really feel with essential oils, I feel with real depression, sadness, anxiety, that you've got to take the herbs inside your body. And I know that essential oils go in the olfactory system, but here's an example of how I used it as a mom. When I would drive a carpool in the morning, all the kids in the carpool were exhausted. They didn't get enough sleep. They were kind of grumpy. And so what I would diffuse in the car was some lemon essential oil or orange or lime or tangerine. And it was kind of like getting a little up, a little kick. And also you can put a diffuser on a timer by your bed and you can have it go off 15 minutes before you have to wake up. And then you wake up to this gorgeous smell of tangerine, lime. These are all essential oils that give you a bit of a boost. And then in the carpool on the way home, when people were hyper and grumpy and didn't eat enough and fighting, I would do some lavender or some sandalwood, which would calm even the savage beast, right? And you can also have a little timer with a diffuser by your bed and 20 minutes before you want to go to bed and it's easy and inexpensive and easy to do. You can have some calming oils in your room. So when you walk into your bedroom, it's like, oh, now it's time for me to stop my brain from working and get into that relaxing mode. So those are the ways that I use essential oils to kind of change the environment and let us walk from the crazy busy world into the calm sedating bedroom. What about rubbing essential oils on the body? You can definitely do that if you dilute them. I do find in my experience, children that has seizures, obviously you have to work with a master herbalist, diluting some frankincense and massaging that into their back, diluted or feet really tends to help. I like them if you want to use them topically, but I think one of their gifts to us is to breathe them in 
And that's why I personally like to diffuse them. I mean, even if you don't have a diffuser, you can literally take like a spray bottle, like a plant water spray bottle and put a couple drops of lavender or sandalwood in it and just spray that in the air. So I really like to just breathe them in, in your car, in your bathroom, in your bedroom, um, in your workplace. That's where I use. And in Mootopia, I go through all the essential oils on the market. I talk about each separate essential oil, what its benefits are, and you can also combine a bunch of different essential oils, just like herbs. So it's very clear in Mootopia. I wrote it in very simple English, very straightforward. It's not complicated. So you can literally pick up Mootopia and read one page at a time and you're gonna walk away with knowledge. It's not a book that you have to read from cover to cover to get the knowledge, just one page of three different essential oils and you're gonna walk away feeling more empowered about the knowledge of essential oils. So good to know. Thank you for sharing that info about essential oils. So we've talked about herbs that help with the immune system. We've talked about herbs that help with depression and just that anxiety calming us down. What are your favorite herbs for stress? Because so many of us, especially in America, are just stressed. We're overwhelmed, working too much. What's your go-to? So again, all the herbs for the emotional health will help with stress. And that's where adaptogens really shine. Adaptogens help you adapt. So we have an herb like schizandra. Schizandra is also made from a berry. And that's an herb that can really help rebalance the system. Rhodiola is considered an adaptogen. It can really help balance the body. So when you use adaptogens, you must take them on a daily basis. Like the best is to take them twice a day for maybe a month or two. So you really lower the cortisol levels. When the cortisol are our fight or flight reflexes in our body, and most of us are living in the fight or flight most of our lives. So taking an adaptogen is definitely gonna help lower those cortisol levels. So I would say that adaptogens um, are what I would use for long-term stress. I'm glad to hear that because I preach that all the time to take adaptogens for stress. So I'm glad you agree with that. Thank you so much for being here on the show today. Where can my listeners find you? So that's great. Um, I have a website, of course, moodtopiabook.com. They can also follow me on Instagram, and that's at Sarahana S S A R A C H A N A S. And on Instagram, I try to put up as often as I can one minute little videos that talk about an herb, an herb of the season, and how to use herbs. And also through my website, you can email me questions. I'm very available to your listeners. And if they want to purchase Mootopia, it's on Amazon and every bookseller out there. So many of the questions that listeners have are answered right there. So I think between my website, my book, and Instagram, that most questions that people have about botanical herbal medicine will be answered. And again, remember, herbalists want to empower people to understand the herbs so they can use them on their own. So if someone has a chronic problem like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, um, fertility issues, then you want to really sit down with an herbalist like myself, where we're really going to give you a protocol that will help rebalance the system. But reading and learning about herbs like lemon balm and skullcap and motherwort, it's really a gift from the planet to people. And I really like people to feel empowered and strong and knowledgeable about these plants that are available to us. Either grow them yourself or there are farmers that are growing them all over the U.S. and the world and making them into tinctures and teas for us. Which is so amazing. And you're so right. They are a gift from nature and we don't use them as often as we should. Right. So I always end my shows with asking my guest what they have found to be the best ingredient in life. So for me, I think asking questions and knowledge. You know, there's the old saying that ignorance is bliss. 
And I suppose that is true because I think that when you're a little ignorant, maybe you can miss everything around you. But what I found in my office of over 30 years now is that when I educate my clients, they just feel stronger and more capable to function in the world. So I would say knowledge, and it doesn't have to be book knowledge. Now we have podcasts, we have YouTube videos, we have people we can call, but asking the questions, not being shy about the questions, not feeling like questions are dumb or embarrassing, that I would say the main ingredients is having the confidence to say when you don't know and ask people that know a little bit more than you do so you have that knowledge to make the decisions on your own. Because when I have clients, I always tell them, before you go to the doctor, make a list of the questions you want the answers for. Because doctors are busy and they're only allowed six minutes per patient. So be prepared and don't think it's a dumb question. Ask the question to your doctor, your herbalist, because really most healthcare practitioners really admire people that ask questions. And a lot of my clients are always, oh, I would never bother my doctor. Oh, I would never ask my doctor. Like, oh, I'm so embarrassed. I wouldn't ask my pharmacist because then I'm going to sound dumb. So my ingredient is don't be intimidated to ask and attain wisdom. I love that. No one has used that as their best ingredient. And it is so true. Knowledge really can empower you and empower you to make the best decisions for you and your family. So thank you so much for sharing that. I loved it. And thank you so much for all of the information that you shared today. I'm excited to read Moodtopia. I'm excited for my listeners to read it and learn more about um, plant medicine. So thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. This was a great interview. Really appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Remember to subscribe to the Just Ingredients podcast to learn more about your health and good ingredients to life. Plus, get daily tips at just.ingredients on Instagram.